How are you? Yeah. Thank you. That was really nice. <laughs> Quiet. Uh, this is the this is the kind of day that students would be saying, "Can we have class outside?" Uh, it's beautiful outside. When my students say that, I always tell them that there are two things that shouldn't be done outside, and teaching is one of them. And uh, they always suspect I mean something. Uh, devious or whatever. I don't even know what the second thing is. Uh, it's, just, it's just something that I say, but I think it's probably true about conferences as well. Actually, I'm not even sure it's true about conferences or teaching, but it's just something to say when you want to stay inside and use your blackboard. Um, so welcome to day three of After Extinction. Uh, was, I had a little time to read the New York Times this morning, and there was a, yet another sad story of uh, not uh, an op-ed not about Silent Spring, but about silent seashores and about the loss of, uh, and really loss and uh, impending extinction of migratory shorebirds. So uh, the beat just keeps going on and uh, I think that'll lead nicely into some of the questions that Joe Masco wants to ask today. Um, just a couple of uh, words of sort of uh, about the day, uh, so we'll do, this is the alternating plenary, then a breakout session, then lunch, then a plenary breakout session, and a round table. So the round table will feature the plenary speakers and I will sit up front and we'll either just each say something initially very briefly or just open it for questions. I think the, the idea of the round table at the end is just to get people to talk and think a bit about what kinds of answers, I guess, that we've been arriving at to the question of what comes after extinction or what further questions we've been arriving at. And, and that's scheduled, I forget, for an hour, 15 hour, half, but we'll just take it as long as we have the energy to take it and, uh, you know, we're, we won't be bound to the clock. So, um, but I think last year for the Anthropocene Feminism Conference, actually, it was a really good session and I anticipate probably the same will happen today. Okay, so without further ado, it's really a pleasure to invite up Gloria Kim, who is our Provost Postdoctoral Fellow this year, and uh, she'll introduce Joe Masker. All right, well, welcome everybody to the end of the end, and um, I feel like after all this contemplation of, of disaster and ruination, the water outside should be replaced with Kool-Aid and we should have like track pants and sleeping pills <laughs> lined up for us outside. So I've, I've arranged for that and the van should be coming shortly. So um, I hope you like track pants. Um, uh, so Joseph Masco is professor of anthropology at the University of Chicago. He is the author of The Nuclear Borderlands, The Manhattan Project um, in post-Cold War New Mexico and that was published with Princeton University Press. That was also a book whose contribution was recognized with multiple awards. Um, he's the author, too, of <clears throat> uh, The Theater of Operations, National Security Affect from the Cold War to the War on Terror, and that was published with Duke University Press last year, 2014, that's last year, yeah. Um, his contribution to the social sciences and humanities has been recognized through awards and fellowships granted um, by organizations including the Rachel Carson Center, the American Council of Learned Societies, both the Bristol and Princeton Institutes for Advanced Studies, uh, the MacArthur Foundation, and the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities. Uh, I'm not going to address his multiple other distinctions and accomplishments because there's too many, um, but uh, Masco's work takes us into the making of worlds of nuclear, of, excuse me, the making of the worlds of nuclear bombs, terrorism warning systems, state secrecy, and the fury of ecological and biological events. He traces these kind of subterranean, atmospheric, um, molecular, and sometimes eerily quiet 
or uh, sometimes forgotten things um, and processes to sites of their eventual material, affective, social, and political fallout. Um, so one of the questions in his work that I see is this question of what gets made under the dark shadow of a looming future catastrophe, whether or not that catastrophe is real or imagined or both. <clears throat> and he doesn't offer us really an easy to stomach response, thus the Kool-Aid um, after the <laughs> talk. So uh, the cultures of American national security and its project to manage future threat, he shows, produce a socio-cultural landscape of anxiety, dread, <laughs> numbness, uh, this is just getting worse, isn't it, um, and uncertainty. <laughs> He looks at how these affects are deployed, uh, modulated, and managed in the service of American national security, uh, projects from civil defense to the war on terror. So delving into these effective situations, uh, his work, among other things, teases apart how habits of thought and perception, modes of collectivity, new discourses and practices, um, both concerning the nation, but also the biosphere and the world at large, have been and are being formed alongside the anticipation of our ruination. Um, so one of the things that, one of the many things that attracts me to Masco's work, which is also one of the reasons why it's such an honor to um, have him here at C21, uh, as we plumb the theme after extinction, is that by historically situating norms uh, of crisis anticipation, he reveals how the experiences of our present time, the time that we live in right now, and the kinds of futures that we worry about today are tethered to the accumulating fallout of past contemplations of, of our end. So really, we are living now in the fallout uh, of this question that we've been asking for a while now of what comes after the end, right? So, Speaking of these weird kind of temporal folds that I think are in um, his work, um, I don't write to scholars to thank them for the work, though occasionally someone impacts my thought in a large enough way that sometimes I feel compelled to do so. <clears throat> so an email I wrote about five years ago, almost, goes like this, October 4, 2009. Dear Dr. Joseph Masco, I have recently completed your book, The Nuclear Borderlands. And that's the end of the email. <laughs> and it was never sent, uh, because why, right? Like, <laughs> what are you going to say? Um, <laughs> I've been living in my bed now for the past week. Um, anyhow, it was never sent. Um, I can't stop crying, no. So anyhow, the beginnings of a thank you note that was written nearly five years past, never delivered, makes it all the more my pleasure today to welcome you to the center. Thank you very much. So between unsent emails and Kool-Aid, that was just a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I hope to live up to it today. So first of all, um, thanks to the center for uh, the invitation to be here. And um, I am interested in thinking about how concepts of the nuclear danger inform concerns about environment today, and I'm hoping that I will convince you that there are some uh, strategic interventions along those lines. Okay, to begin. The emerging uh, environmental consequences of the industrial age offer rebounding visions of ecological calamity in the 21st century. These dangers are not new, but rather have been built slowly over decades of human industry, created in the paradoxical pursuit of security, energy, and profit. We find today that the very tools of building our highly globalized modern society are also cumulative ecological dangers, 
as the unintended effects of industrial activity across petrochemical, nuclear, and synthetic chemical regimes produce hazards that exceed our capacity to control, requiring a new assessment of nature, society, and economy. Collectively, people now face industrial dangers that are planetary and operate on vastly different timescales, uh, challenging perception and action while changing the grounds of the political. What should be our collective orientation towards a future that is shifting radically in both its qualities and risks? How do we recalibrate our senses, actions, and expectations as the long-standing modernist assumption of an ever-increasing security through continual technological revolution is replaced by competing visions of precarity and loss? Familiar dangers, nuclear war, and new ones, a destabilized climate, challenge global governance while also upending foundational notions about technology, modernity, and progress. So the nature of the state as a problem-solving apparatus, as well as the state of nature as the dominion of life itself, are at play in our historical moment in radical ways, not only as conceptual categories, but also as a set of embodied relations. So the ecological future is not what many residents of the global north, relying on constant technological revolution to steadily improve everyday comforts, once assumed or even hoped it would be. Industrial toxicity is shifting Earth systems across atmosphere, ocean, ice cap, geology, and, and biosphere, and is on a trajectory to transform the environmental conditions that promoted such spectacular human expansion over the past <coughs> 10,000 years, a period that saw uh, the invention of agriculture, the written word, the internal combustion engine, the atomic bomb, and the smartphone. <laughs> This realization is shifting the domain of security from states and institutions to the envelope of the atmosphere itself, a rediscovery of atmospheric chemistry as a foundational but highly changeable support system for life as we know it. Increasingly, environmental problems are only really comprehensible at the planetary scale, a move that transforms the diversity of global cultures and regional economies into a species-level challenge to governance. This requires, I think, more than new science, engineering, and statecraft. It also requires new imaginaries, new visions of ecological relationality, and a wide-ranging exploration of the codependence and co-production of species and Earth systems. Climate change is a collective danger that invites us to rethink basic aspects of contemporary life. And my talk today is ultimately about conceptualization, uh, about how to think on temporal and spatial scales that exceed human senses, and for that, I think we need uh, both science and art, both technical judgments about material conditions and creative efforts to generate new points of orientation for citizens who are increasingly positioned not only as consumers and members of nation states, but also as vulnerable, if hyperactive, Earth dwellers. In this regard, as we all know, the concept of the Anthropocene has been a remarkably powerful intervention in the past few years, moving quickly from a formal proposal within the discipline of geology into a wide-ranging transdisciplinary conversation, uh, generating new research programs, journals, seminars, and workshops across Europe, Asia, North, and South America. Uh, in the past three years alone, barely a month has gone by without a major conference somewhere on the planet addressing anthropocenic concerns. Uh, including our own conversation today, uh, but just to make the point, uh, I did a little survey of just the kinds of conversations that the Anthropocene has generated. Uh, this takes us from uh, 2011 through June of uh, 2013. And of course, the center here has been a key member of uh, this conversation, and it just keeps going. So as you can see, even this partial list demonstrates that the Anthropocene is both an era and a qualifier, linking water, air, land, society, culture, the humanities, shelling, feminisms, and even bats as anthropogenic uh, subjects. Formally, the Anthropocene was, of course, proposed uh, by Paul Crutzen and Eugene Sturmer in 2000 to recognize the industrial age human as a geological force. And the professional geological societies are now debating if there's a stratum in the earth that is a clear marker of human activity and could be the basis for declaring a new geological period. Critson initially uh, proposed uh, the start of the industrial age as the so-called golden spike of the Anthropocene, which we saw a beautiful exhibit uh, 
considering yesterday. Uh, and more recently, though, he has argued that atmospheric nuclear explosions have left the clearest industrial signature in geology and biosphere. And um, I think actually the nuclear age um, might well get my vote for this start of the Anthropocene, not only because it's a clear signal in the, both geology and <coughs> biology uh, on a planetary scale, but also because uh, 1945 marks the moment where human beings become an existential danger to themselves for the first time. So it has that combined uh, effect of a trace as well as an existential danger. In 2016, the stratigraphic associations uh, are scheduled to make a judgment on geological periodization, perhaps even elevating the nuclear age to a geological period. So what happens to the Cold War when the nuclear age becomes a geological period? Are we prepared to see uh, technological effects so radically decontextualized from their historical and political context, liquidating political epochs in favor of geological time? Or the geologists might alternatively continue this uh, rather terrific mischief, I think, by postponing their judgment altogether or deciding that we've not yet entered a new uh, geological era. <coughs> but no matter how you approach it, uh, their intervention into contemporary politics with the concept of the Anthropocene has been a bold and I'd say a rather brilliant bit of agitprop on behalf of, in, of environmental sustainability. And it's mirrored in the debates about nuclear winter in the 1980s and the fallout campaigns of the anti-fallout campaigns of the 1950s. So it's actually not the first time uh, that the earth scientists have made a major intervention into political life. So the remarkable success of the Anthropocene in a few short years <coughs> has produced a few critics as well. The concept clearly contributes to a scientific discourse with, uh, within the earth sciences. But I think it's somewhat less helpful for those disciplines, including the social sciences and humanities, that do not think on geological timescales. I've been uneasy with the fast adoption of the concept for four reasons. First, uh, is that in the act of recognizing the unintended cumulative consequences of human industrial activities, it names people as the core agents on Earth. If we were to limit the Anthropocene to simply the production of industrial toxicity, I would certainly agree. But there are so many different kinds of agency on Earth, and it's a mistake to imagine even as a political exercise or a public mobilization strategy that people are the only actors within ecological systems. The Anthropocene as a category risks a meta-human agency that all too easily morphs into a non-scientific claim of sovereignty over the Earth rather than underscoring the unintended cumulative destructive effects of people upon it. So I think we need to be careful with the concept that can mobilize human ignorance into a vehicle for a new claim to sovereignty, even if it, even if it offers a maximally cautionary tale of human agency. Um, secondly, the Anthropocene can easily be constituted as a mirror to Cold War logics of closed systems, of limited systems interacting in positive and negative feedback loops and thus subject to command and control reasoning. So this, push, this is the push towards geoengineering. This again risks installing a kind of anthropocentrism uh, as the Earth's atmosphere has changed dramatically over the eons and has only recently become <coughs> highly condu uh, conduct conducive for human life and expansion. As a shorthand, for extremely complex articulations across domains, the Anthropocene can install a desire for a normative planetary state, one that in its focus on human creaturely comforts uh, could just as easily in the long history of the planet be considered extraordinary. That is, the Holocene is an exceptional era for atmospheric chemistry on Earth, just one particularly useful to people. Third, there are many societies on Earth that are not particularly anthropogenic, meaning that the Anthropocene is less accurate than talking about the spe specific Anthropocenic societies, economies, and activities. And I think it's vitally important that in the effort to address planetary scale ecological changes, that global inequalities are not subsumed into a species level critique. Mm -hmm. And finally, the Anthropocene is now most directly mobilized via apocalyptic visions of the future, drawing on tropes developed mo most directly by nuclear crisis, as a tool of political mobilization. Thus, we have a language for, of ultimate crisis designed for one technological problem being used in another context that is not a parallel situation at all. Nuclear war is, of course, fast and short and in the hands of a few. Climate change is long and slow 
as well as a cumulative and accelerating effect of consumption and industry. Uh, and the depictions of danger should acknowledge these distinctions. So Haraway, of course, has recently critiqued the Anthropocene, suggesting that it naturalizes a specific historical political formation, capitalism, as the only human mode. And she suggests that instead of the Anthropocene, it should be a capitalocene. And then went on to suggest actually maybe the chulocene is better after the many tentacled fictional creature created by horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. Latour has, of course, returned to the concept of Gaia and suggesting that it is a system with multiple kinds of non-human agency, one that is also open-ended. Thus, the interaction between living things and Earth systems is not a closed homeostatic cybernetic system, but one that can take an infinite number of forms at the planetary scale. Nigel Clark recently has productively <coughs> proposed a foundational rethinking of the term geopolitics, suggesting that we need now to attend not only to international relations, but also to the material conditions of life on planet Earth. And I've suggested that uh, we're actually entering the age of fallout, as environmental crises today are the product of decades of human labor, consumption, petrochemical innovation, and militarism. So our environmental crisis uh, is the ongoing aftermath of 20th century industrialism, raising important questions, I think, about temporal lag, environmental perceptions across petrochemical, synthetic chemical, and nuclear regimes, as well as the cumulative force of technological revolution. In any case, the necessary core project of reducing toxic emissions requires a public mobilization to deal with highly complex future dangers that uh, engage the total environment. And this makes the problem of environmental crisis not only one of science and simulation, but also of communication and visualization. How indeed can we take infinitely complex processes involving the interactions of people, technologies, industries, atmospheres, water, land, and climate, and make them intelligible to non-Earth scientists in a way that promotes radical changes in politics and economy. On this point, uh, it's important to turn to the Intergo Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which since uh, 1988 has been studying the terms and possible futures of a warming planet. The IPCC, as we all know, is a quite remarkable scientific and political achievement as it brings together tens of thousands of scientists from all over the world in an effort to create a consensus view of changes in Earth systems while also offering scenarios for future uh, climactic changes. And if we were to think about the question of visualization, here's one slide from uh, the 2014 impacts report. This is, of course, a technical slide depicting the complex interdependent processes uh, discussed in the broader IPCC report. Loaded with uh, expert terms, it is a risk assessment of astonishing complexity, combining the total environment with human economic <coughs> activities and politics. Here's the IPCC's basic argument about our species relationship to the future, making the simple if vitally important case that what we do today impacts conditions in the coming decades and centuries. It recruits readers to an idea of a resilient global population, one that both mitigates and withstands ecological change. It lends itself to an ideal of global governance without stating who can or will make decisions on behalf of the species, of all species. Thus, its uh, human species view is at odds with our current political reality in which the nation state and the corporate forms with their much narrower fields of interest say population security and profit, uh, are the basis for politics. In terms of mobilizing publics to consider existential crisis, the nuclear age offers the key example, I think. What was called civil defense in the United States was a multi-generational effort to teach Americans to fear the bomb in a specific way and to mobilize them as nuclear subjects. The mushroom cloud became the emblem of disaster after 1945, <clears throat> an image that could be confidently evoked to produce a set of cultural associations that were collectively meaningful. The mushroom cloud, however, was also quite literally an explicit branding of the nuclear danger by the US security state, a carefully calibrated form that served uh, as an image of ultimate destruction, but also created a distant viewer, one removed from the event as spectator to it. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Nuclear imagery, carefully controlled and circulated uh, during the early Cold War in the United States, was designed to mobilize Americans as Cold Warriors. And it also created, for many, an experience of nuclear sublimity, a perverse new kind of attraction to witnessing a destruction that did not need to be felt or shared because, because one was visually positioned as external to it. And this kind of imagery is really different if you jump to Japan and think about the nuclear uh, cultures and uh, representational strategies. Uh, as well as for many indigenous societies around the world that were uh, involved in uh, uh, testing of various kinds and exposures of various kinds. So there are other nuclear um, references as well that could be drawn on. So nuclear imagery thus raises basic theoretical questions about perception, violence, and collective death that also need to be addressed by contemporary climate politics, which often rely on the tropes of nuclear war, a kind of total destruction, to constitute urgency around carbon emissions and a slowly destabilizing environment. Indeed, a world that is increasingly more hostile to live in across health, food production, air quality, and weather is, a much, more, is much more difficult to articulate in a single image as it represents an ever-decreasing quality of life rather than the total absence of it. In the aftermath of World War I, Freud explored how death was managed psychically and considered how it was that the most civilized, that is the most industrialized of nations, proved to be the very ones capable of violence on a new scale. Climate change makes this argument anew as it recognizes that petrochemical toxicity in all of its forms is a uniquely modern achievement of the industrialized world. Freud argued that people maintain two opposed impulses concerning death. The first was a complete denial of one's actual death noting the removal of death from public life in Europe at the end of the 19th century, the effort to render sickness and death socially invisible that preceded the invention of World War, Freud wrote, quote, we cannot indeed imagine our own death. Whenever we try to do so, we find that we survive ourselves as spectators. Mm -hmm. The school of psychoanalysis could thus assert that at bottom, no one believes in his own death, which amounts to saying, in the unconscious, every one of us is convinced of his immortality. So we survive ourselves as spectators. This is a curious phrase, one that underscores the basic tension between an internal expectation of immortality and the conscious knowledge that everyone has a defined <coughs> life course and meaning of death. It suggests an internal dissociation towards death, allowing us to be external witnesses to our own injury or end. This contradiction is managed in at least two ways. The first is to psychically locate death somewhere else. And Freud talks here about the power of fiction, of distant wars and disasters, of newspapers, to give a precise location to total endings, one that allows death to be contemplated, but also pushed from the ego and externalized. The other mechanism is, of course, the, the death drive, which Freud posited was a basic orientation of the human organism towards an ultimate release from physical struggle and a return to a state of inertness. The pursuit of pleasure and gratification may motivate life, but a drive towards a feeling of nothingness is coterminous with it. Thus, for Freud, we all have a complex orientation towards our own death, one that is managed via displacements and overdeterminations, but that is also linked to an internal desire for an ultimate release, an embrace of a pain-free oblivion. So this raises, I think, uh, important questions concerning planetary existential danger. When we contemplate images of the end, of the apocalypse, of extinction, what kind of work are we doing? Is the pleasure in that mode of reflection an orientation towards the last and final release? Or is it alternatively the deflection that allows the ego to feel removed from death, and if not an immortal, then at least served and entertained by locating such finality elsewhere? And I think we should think about this the next time you head to the multiplex and are confronted with the story of nonstop mayhem, or read of a cataclysm on the other side of the planet with an interested detachment. The aesthetics, even erotics, of death is a long-standing cultural concern in Western theory, but one that today intersects with an emerging planetary consciousness, one that demands uh, scaling local dangers up to the earthly sphere and back again. Dangers are being remade today as simultaneously hyper-local formations and as collective planetary concerns, a fact that I think requires an evolutionary collective consciousness, one merging a new orientation towards consumer desire with a new kind of statecraft. So for the remainder of the talk today, I'd like to explore some dimensions of contemporary ecological crisis 
and the broader pro uh, issue of visualizing collective danger by uh, engaging a remarkable exhibit that occurred at the uh, Renaissance Society in Chicago, curated by Hamza Walker recently. An explicit engagement with the aesthetic pull of extinction, Walker's Suicide Narcissus exhibit helps us think about the limits of human perception as well as the psychosocial effects of radical collective endangerment. Walker presents six artworks, each in a different medium, inviting us to think through these questions of collective loss and total endings. In ancient Greek mythology, as you all remember, I'm sure, Narcissus was a boy of unusual beauty who, failing to return the love of wood and mountain nymphs, was cursed by the <coughs> god of retribution, Nemesis. The curse, of course, was exquisite. Having never seen his own image, Nemesis leads Narcissus to encounter it in a pool of water. Not recognizing himself, Narcissus falls so powerfully in love with what he sees that he cannot avert his gaze, eventually wasting away by the side of the pool until he dies of, star of starvation. So this, dis this depiction of a misrecognition with total identification has been a powerful concept for psychoanalysis, informing the logics of Lacan's mirror stage as well as Freud's earlier notion of the ego ideal, an internalized image of a perfected self that is unattainable as lived experience. The story of Narcissus has come to inform how we think today about self-absorption and ego formation, as well as about love and death. But we could also underscore other aspects of the myth, the less remembered today. It's also fundamentally a story about ecological retribution, as the earth spirits offended by Narcissus call down a divine and total retribution against him, ending in a death that Narcissus could avoid simply by changing his field of vision, simply by looking away and moving on. Nemesis's curse works in the story to offer a kind of absolute justice for creatures of nature injured by the self-absorption and vanity of human beings, a retribution that is played out to the point of extinction. Walker's Suicide Narcissus exhibit offers a rich and varied set of interventions on planetary ecological crisis, uh, the most important but most conceptually challenging issue of our time, I think. Each contributor stages a specific point of view on monumental collective loss, inviting viewers to consider not just the aesthetic forms, but also the current conceptual frames available for thinking past our own existence. Each piece in the exhibit is clever and meticulously crafted, working together to create a rebounding debate about the ability to perceive imminent loss. And I'd like to suggest here that contemplating the end is not a vehicle for distraction, but precisely because of the hyper-focus of the curation and the pieces themselves, uh, serves as cultural critique, allowing a mode of address that can generate a productive shock in the viewing subject. Walker's intent is to interrogate the conceptual space that allows one to stand outside of an ongoing collective disaster and merely observe it as spectacle. Commenting on the American love of the special effects driven disaster movie, he writes in the exhibition uh, catalog, quote, global warming and summer blockbusters have been in lockstep, record breaking temperatures corresponding to record breaking box office earnings. <clears throat> Draped over summer's Hollywood tent poles as these big budget films are called, are plots sagging under the weight of humanity's impending demise. Whether it's in the hand of, hands of the rabid zombies in World War Z, or whether you happen to be holed up in James Franco's pad during the rapture, uh, as in, this is the end, the threat of our end is a story as recyclable as cardboard. While ours is certainly not the only story to tell, we are, for better or worse, the narrator, one whose sense of standing outside the story as it evolves our death is a form of denial. The trilobites tell us what we already know. The happy ever after is a chapter belonging to another species. So the fatalism in Walker's statement here is, of course, I think, undercut by the sophistication of his curatorial work, which invites us to reconsider how death as spectacle functions and offers a variety of vantage points from which to constitute a different politics. So in the remainder of the talk, I'd like to reflect on each of the artworks in the exhibit, exploring the temporalities, ecologies, and visual logics of total endings under the rubric of the six extinctions. Okay, distinction number one. This is Lucy Scare's monumental installation, Leviathan's Edge, which offers uh, viewers a compelling figure depth problem as a giant skeleton appears just on the edge of in intelligibility through the cutaways of a white-walled installation. The white-on-white 
context of the installation shifts our perspective as we move closer to an obviously large, too large in fact, what could it possibly be, animal that exceeds our field of vision. The partial, carefully framed points of view we are allowed on the skeletal remains draws attention to the partial vision we always have on fossilized life. Embedded in earth or stone, ancient remains are always fragile and partial, requiring some degree of reconstruction and imagination. Leviathan's Edge invites us to consider the creatures now long gone, as well as the endangerment of contemporary beings, the ongoing extinctions. Its partial field of vision requires us to fill in and guess at the creature itself, which also posits the remains as timeless, perhaps ancient, perhaps contemporary, perhaps from the future. It invites us to think how natural history is enmeshed in human history, while underscoring the fragmented and partial vision any standpoint allows on death itself. The whale skeleton that might be a dinosaur or some other fantastic being we do not have a name for is beautiful and beyond comprehension here because it remains both mediated and fragmented. It also reminds us that there's not enough space in all of our museums to account for all the long gone life forms. The small slivers of visual access we have to the remains, the cutouts in the installation or the fossil traces of life on planet Earth also underscore our limited ability to apprehend, let alone comprehend, the edges of an extinction. It's almost here-ness, or what Tom Van Doren has recently put it as the flight ways of emerging species lost. A little bit of background, familiar to most, I'm sure. Uh, Earth scientists will tell you that over 99% of the life forms that have ever lived on our planet have gone extinct. That's 99%. Extinction is not the exception, but rather the rule uh, over and within the deep history of life on Earth. The best estimates today are that four billion species have evolved over the past 3.5 billion years on this planet. In addition to the process of natural selection in eliminating particular species, there have been five mass extinction events, periods where due to planetary scale climactic changes, two thirds or more of all organisms on Earth have disappeared. And this is a technical chart of those events. The World Wildlife Fund in 2014 uh, issued a report that concluded um, that in addition to this notion of extinction, over 50% of total wildlife, uh, a reduction of over 50% of total wildlife occurred from 1970 to 2010. So not extinction, but just a reduction in the population of 50% of the non-human beings on the planet. Um, thus, uh, not just species, but entire ecosystems die with some regularity, a point that should make every mode of living both an evolutionary accomplishment and a fragile historical achievement. Today, as we know, there's uh, much distinction of a sixth mass extinction event, an ongoing shift in the terms of living on our planet drawn from the combined impacts of habitat destruction, pollution, overharvesting, invasive species, and human population growth. So this sixth mass extinction will be unique uh, in the planet's history as it does not arrive in the form of an asteroid collision or a volcanic eruption, but rather through the hyperactive work of one indigenous species, people. The industrial age human has become an ecological and even a geological force, constituting a future of fewer species, reduced biodiversity, and potential disruptions in the food, in the food chain. Skyer's Leviathan's Edge invites us to consider the once and future remains of monumental life on planet Earth and to consider the edge, that is to locate and value the precise threshold of such a cataclysm, the tipping point between life and extinction. We've got five more extinctions to go, so you gotta hang in there. Right? It's like happy, happy, happy so uh, this is extinction number two. Uh, Katie Patterson's uh, laser etched all the dead stars poses the problem of extinction directly while also raising more subtle issues of temporal lag and misperception. Documenting the 27,000 known dead stars in the universe, the piece invites us to think not about uh, galactic space and infinity, but about the, uh, about the quality of life from dead stars and the temporality of seeing. Here's a close-up. The speed of light travels at just under 300 million meters per second. Sunlight, 
takes just over eight minutes to travel from the surface of the sun to the surface of the earth. Thus, when looking at the night sky, there's a lag between the light one sees and its point of origin, meaning that some fraction of the light is from stars that are actually dead, with that last flicker of light energy now just reaching our planet. How then, with limited human senses, uh, can we actually see extinction? Under what terms and temporalities does a total loss become visible? Presenting a universe of potential answers to this question in spherical form, also kind of evoking Earth, Patterson also invites us to think about the kind of light our sun gives out uh, and the time it takes to travel across the universe and what it might look like after it goes supernova in some five to 10 billion years. Patterson also suggests that extinction is all around us and that human senses operate with a temporal lag between living and dying. She provokes questions about how many species, processes, and ideas are merely the after image of themselves, a loss that has already occurred just not yet visible as such. Today, pollinators, the bees, moths, and butterflies that enable plants of all kinds to reproduce are, of course, in crisis. The colony collapse disorder among the honeybee populations is part of a larger shift in how those insects live and die. And I think the center recently heard from Jay Kosek on this point. It uh, has a spectacular forthcoming book on bees. Uh, theories abound, but the likely cause of the collapse is the, uh, from the combined effects of chemical <coughs> fertilizers, climate change, and pollution. Put differently, we, can, we see in the vast die-offs of pollinators today a variety of species under environmental stress to a kind of maximal degree. Are these the terrestrial version of Patterson's dead stars? A question simply of the temporal lag and not the end result. So one very ambitious proposal for climate governance involves determining the operating pr uh, parameters for Earth systems and mobilizing human society to keep specific domains within the peak thresholds of, for existing life. Known as the Planetary Boundaries Proposal, uh, this entirely reasonable act of environmental governance seeks to transform the climate crisis into a safe operating space for humanity and to constitute a new kind of planetary stewardship. The idea is breathtaking in its vision, detailing nine core areas for planetary management. Climate change, ocean acidification, ozone depletion, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, global freshwater use, land use, biodiversity loss, atmospheric aerosol loading, and chemical pollution. <coughs> as an aspirational politics, this is a significant intellectual contribution as it links individuals, organizations, and states to specific goals that can be measured and encourages all parties to engage in planetary thinking. But of course, it's also an engineering approach to planetary process, striving for sublime levels of control of human uh, technical, technological and ecological interactions. Earth systems are also not closed and can be subject to both abrupt and long-term changes. Thus, the promise of the Planetary Boundaries Project is to intervene across ecological domains and to calibrate complex systems with multimodal interactions and feedbacks to support specifically human comfort levels. A highly nuanced proposal for geoengineering of Earth systems, the planetary boundaries process embraces a macro view of environmental risk. Here, the call for subtle con uh, control of planetary process overwhelms more simple and direct human-centric responses to climate change. Things like population control, reducing meat consumption, and renewable energies. Thus, the intricacies of Earth systems can also be in an invitation to a kind of suicide narcissus, promoting an aestheticized love of complexity and command and control reasoning that prevents one from simply looking away, seeing a simpler and more direct solution, embracing a different way of living. Extinction number three. So this is Thomas Bauman's Tau Sling, which is a mechanized installation in which a rope is continuously twisted and reflected in a mirror, constituting an ever-changing, perhaps ever-tightening noose. It's mesmerizing precisely because uh, of its slow-moving tangle of elements, a machinery that fascinates as it constricts and knots endlessly. And I have a little clip of it in action here, which I hope will work. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, so I think this is a beautiful metaphor for many of today's industrial legacies, uh, while also referencing many forms of direct, particularly racialized violence in the Americas. It's an ever-twisting form, and in it we can consider how and where the careful work of building a machine, a security system, an energy infrastructure, a global economy, creates loops and treacherous side effects that are now challenging basic logics of sustainability. Bauman's Tao Sling is a machinery of insecurity, one constantly in motion, creating an enticing, even hypnotic vantage point on constriction and even strangulation. In 1955, the mathematician John von Neumann addressed this point directly in a rather remarkable Fortune magazine essay entitled, Can We Survive Technology? In that piece, he wrote, quote, the great globe itself is in a rapidly maturing crisis, a crisis attributable to the fact that the environment in which technological process must occur has become both undersized and underorganized. Literally and figuratively, we are running out of room. At long last, we began to feel the effects of the finite actual size of the Earth in a critical way." Unquote. Von Neumann here uh, contemplates how technological revolution works on ever-widening scales, reaching a limit only when space runs out at the planetary level, and posits specific areas of immediate collective concern. Nuclear weapons and weather control are his big fears. The nuclear revolution, he states, will transform everything it touches, potentially giving new energy sources, but the immediate hurdle, the fear that overwhelmed the 1950s and 60s, involved, of course, overcoming its immediate military application, as nuclear war threatens all works of civilization directly. Thus, surviving nuclear technology is the first act of uh, making a better world uh, through its peaceful application. Similarly, he uh, worries in 1955 about weather modification as an emerging technology and is concerned about how carbon emissions from industrial production could produce a substantial warming of the planet, leading, in his words, to melting ice caps and a changing climate. Mm. Industrial emissions, he suggests, could be a planetary problem much like the atomic bomb, constituting an immediate threat, exacerbated by the possibility of offensive weather control as a new tool of war. Thus, his positive utopia of weather modification is undermined by a new world of climactic warfare. And for von Neumann, technological revolution uh, affects the entirety of the planet, leaving no future room for expansion or collective error. Actually, I'd say here on uh, the question of geoengineering, the National Academy of Sciences came out a few weeks ago with a report that was suggesting there needs to be uh, research on geoengineering, which they are now call calling climate modification, uh, for two reasons. One, to understand how it could be done, but the second, to build an early warning system to address the question of whether it is being done. <laughs> One might then consider von Neumann's essay a foundational statement in the literature of the Anthropocene, as it suggests that technological growth scaled to the planetary dimension exceeds human understanding and control to become a force in its own right. Indeed, we have today achieved a world of climate alteration, uh, but not through uh, conscious decision making or warfare, as von Neumann predicted, but through an unrestrained petrochemical based capitalism. His fascination with technological revolution and industrial scaling thus works here very much like Bauman's installation, a mesmerizing apparatus of perpetual motion involving an ever-tightening noose. Or as von Neumann put it at the conclusion of his essay, for progress there is no cure. So this uh, is a remarkable image from The Lancet, um, a citation there by Costello. Uh, which makes a vitally important point about climate change and does so, I think, in a remarkable way. So this marks the proportional local scale and location of carbon emissions in relationship to their proportional regional health effects. Mm -hmm. So the top frame has to do with uh, which parts of the world are producing, producing carbon, and the bottom frame has to do with where those emissions are likely to cause substantial changes in public health. Um, so the planetary politics of carbon here are an emerging violence connecting the global north and the global south, producing what Rob Nixon would call the slow violence of illness. But of course, thinking with Bauman's installation, carbon is always a noose that tightens in all directions for, the global, uh, for as the global south achieves middle class consumption standards over the coming century, the health effects of an expanding southern petrochemical economy 
uh, will be directed northward as well eventually, creating an ongoing spiral of planetary health effects. Here, consumption in the global north entangles health in the global south, creating, creating an ever more violent circuit. And I think actually this kind of visualization is super important for dramatizing the differences in uh, productivity and effects that sometimes gets lost in the Anthropocene debates. And so this kind of visualization, I think, is quite important. OK, we're up to extinction number four. Got a few more to go. Hang in there. Uh, this is Daniel uh, Stickman's uh, Mangrains 16 millimeter, which offers a slow five-minute tracking shot directly into a rainforest. Seemingly unpopulated by people or animals, the soundtrack tells us that the space is filled with wildlife unseen. And in the Suicide uh, Narcissus exhibition, 16 millimeter was projected in a darkened room against a white screen. And I have a clip of it here. So the beautiful canopy of plants and trees revealed here is dense. And there's no trail or trace of a human footstep. Instead, the 16 millimeter camera glides and hovers through the biosphere, moving seamlessly through a jungle space that would be difficult for a person to traverse. What is this point of view that the camera offers us? And who are we that we can see in this way? The film documents the archetypal endangered space of our time, rainforests, valued for its intense biodiversity as well as management of carbon in the atmosphere. But there's also something uncanny about the camera movement. A mechanically synced to the rotation of the film spool, which suggests a kind of archival project, one in which the end of the tracking shot could also be the end of the garden itself. The lack of a human trace also allows this image of the biosphere to be both perfect and timeless a museum of nature for a world that has eliminated such spaces. It's a vision of the forest without us, but one carefully crafted to give viewers a privileged, if decidedly non-human, point of view. In Hansa Walker's installation, uh, a cutaway of the projection booth revealed the 16 mil uh, millimeter projector itself, showing a looping analog film stock as it rattles through the machine. So this is an analog photographic technology that is in extinction in the digital age, as well as a film about extinction. And here we might consider the multiple ways in which a petrochemical economy threatens the rainforests of our time, as well as the medium of film itself as a petrochemical emulsion that structures the social consciousness of the 20th century. The fossil fuels that we use to run our economy are derived out of the decomposition of plant and animal organisms going back hundreds of millions of years. Fossil, fluor, fu, <laughs> fossil fuels are thus, in a very literal sense, congealed time. Film is a petrochemical medium that measures time. Thus, Mangrain's 16 millimeter project can be read as a complex statement on how we perceive and instrumentalize time itself. It also underscores how the emulsions that enable filmic vision participate in the larger petrochemical extraction regime that has wrecked havoc from the polar ice caps to the rainforest to the deserts of the Middle East. That so many of the iconic technologies of materni modernity, from oil to fertilizer to film, are also highly destructive petrochemical forms, flammable and unstable over time, reveals at another level the unending challenge of truly valuing 
of really seeing a non-renewable resource. Extinction number five. This is Nicole Six and Paul Petrus's uh, Spatial Intervention One. It's a 28 minute video, exquisitely photographed with a simple premise. It presents a man on a frozen lake hacking away at the ice he's standing on until it collapses. I'll show you just a couple pieces of this. My apologies to the artist for not being able to show the entire work. So this video demonstrates the dangers, of course, of undermining the natural systems we depend on for support, the ice, atmosphere, land. It's also a quite marvelous study of labor in the era of climate change, as the lake here is really not so easily broken. It takes 28 minutes of hard, sweaty work to get to the ultimate result. And the end, of course, does not happen on screen, but with a cut to black and a scream, leaving its final form to our imagination. Extinction here resists representation, becoming something that can only be staged suggestively. In this work, Narcissus sees himself reflected in the frozen lake and just keeps hammering away, <laughs> transfixed on breaking through to the other side, even if it means imminent doom. The film, which forces the viewer to attend to each stroke of the ax, creates moments of boredom, suggesting the everyday activities, the unnecessary trip in the car, purchase of the plastic wrapped produce to ship from the other side of the world, the eating of the hamburger, that collectively move climate. It also asks us to consider which strokes of the ax matter in the end. Which ones do permanent damage? In Walker's presentation, the sound of the ax hitting the frozen lake echoed through the gallery long before one sees the actual artwork, setting up a peculiar experience of viewing and hearing alternate takes on extinction. Thus, like many of the pieces in the overall exhibit, Spatial Intervention 1 is ultimately about perception and temporality and about time running out. In the professional assessment being made for the Anthropocene, geologists mobilized many forms of data to depict the radical changes that begin around 1950. Population, GDP, water use, paper consumption, telephones, tourism, all take off dramatically after World War II. And here's a slide from uh, one of the key articles on the Anthropocene from uh, Stefan et al. Uh, these indexes are directly tied to parallel appraisals of carbon emissions, ozone depletion, floods, biodiversity loss, and so on. And what struck me about this list is that McDonald's restaurants are a key indicator of climate change, <laughs> as cows are a huge contributor to green greenhouse gases at every stage of the production of a hamburger. These metrics are crucial as they recognize how everyday routine consumer desire now constitutes a planetary force. Not coincidentally, the great acceleration, as many are calling the shift in global consumption patterns, is also coterminous with the nuclear age, making 1950 the inflection point for both climate crisis and nuclear crisis. 
And if you see what all these charts are doing, is just taking you, on, I'm not sure if you can see it well, to basically 1950 where these different registers of consumption uh, shoot up dramatically and are linked to similar changes in uh, our systems. So how to see everyday activities, eating, transportation, water use, energy use, as well as national security as a planetary force is an immediate challenge today. After all, industrial civilization has been largely devoted to creating and expanding creature comforts, as well as the very uh, idea of progress, as the very index of progress. Consumer pleasure is therefore at the heart of climate change, requiring not only the complex analytics of the IPCC, but also complex understandings of psyches, cultures, desires, and even nervous systems. Okay, we're at the last extinction. Extinction number six. Uh, this is selections from Harris uh, Ipanamotas and da uh, Daniel Gustav Kramer's The Infinite Library. Here, books mostly drawn from the mid-20th century have been broken apart and the pages reassembled in radical new combinations. The project of deconstruction and assembly shifts the nature of the human archive, exploding genre and language to produce new texts, a new collection of works for a post-enlightenment library. Encased in glass as artifacts, the Infinite Library attempts a kind of species thinking of the literary, merging fiction, science, self-help, and the arts into some new kind of strange category. The books explode the evolution of the modern sciences and humanities, a core product of modernity, to offer stories of a new kind, but made from pre-existing intellectual and artistic materials. So the question this installation raised for me is, who could be the reader of these texts? Are they imagined as artifacts collected from the ruins by an extraterrestrial archaeologist? This post-genre library is one that needs a future reader, perhaps one that does not yet exist. It's an infinite library, both because the fragments of existing knowledge can be endlessly reorganized, but also perhaps because the very modernist forms of reasoning that have created our current notions of genre are complicit with the nation state and the industrial logics that have produced the linked nuclear and climate crises. It took experts of all kinds to build our current archive, just as it took the combined work of physicists, engineers, chemists, and mathematicians to create nuclear weapons and a petrochemical economy. These cumulative knowledge projects implicate the archive itself in a kind of auto-destruction on a species scale. The Panamoda and Kramer, however, offer a vision of an alternative archive, one in which the disciplinary lines developed from the French philosophes first encyclopedia project, an inaugural event of the Enlightenment, to the drone killing machine circulating parts of the earth today are no longer coherent. The accumulated knowledge of humanity is present, but radically reorganized, montaged to a new aesthetics and potentially new disciplines and new outcomes. The Infinite Library might well ask, how do we keep the knowledge base of modernity while constituting a different science, technology, and art to enable a different collective future? So in conclusion, in Hansa Walker's uh, remarkable vision, the first step to dealing with collective ec ecological danger is to become attuned to its level of consumption, image making, and knowledge economy. It is to resist the spectacle of mass death as well as the death trap in order to contemplate alternative futures. Suicide Narciss Narcissus attempts to shock the viewer out of a normalized consumer economy, one in which disaster is not a call to collective consciousness, but rather a spectacle to be enjoyed via psychic distancing, consumer satisfaction, repetition, and depoliticization. Walker asks us to reconsider and to reimagine a future that operates on vastly different terms, precisely by inviting viewers with such clarity and pre precision to consider the total cost of not doing so. Thus, the immediate answer to the problem of visualizing planetary ecological crisis today is not to consolidate climate change into a single image, offering a mushroom cloud for a new emergency, but rather to proliferate modes of conceptualization and visualization of ecological data that can allow wide contemplation of the complexity of human and non-human inter interactions, and most importantly, to uh, evolve radically with those understandings. Thank you.
So we have some time for questions and answers. And I see someone's hand shoot up right away. Hi. Hi. Um, really fascinating paper. I I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about how you um, understand the relationship between the nuclear crisis and the climate crisis, because throughout a lot of the paper, you imply that they're linked, but fairly early on, you also sort of caution against. Um, you say like the temporal dimensions mm -hmm. are really different. So yeah. nuclear is sort of fast and instantaneous and climate is slow. Um, and that's certainly true of the detonation. But it seems to me that that also overlooks um, or doesn't take into account radiation. Because radiation sure. is, the, the impacts of radiation, soma, the somatic impacts of radiation have an affinity with the, cli the planetary impacts of climate change and that they're both forms of slow violence. So yeah, I wanted absolutely. to hear you talk a little bit more. Yeah, about that. yeah, thanks for that. I'm happy to clarify. Um, so I think that um, there's two different questions here. One has to do with how a kind of public campaign of mobilization happens, right? And the chief example of that is uh, civil defense uh, in the US context of the 1950s, which was a very strategic uh, political project of emotional management and uh, community mobilization through crafting very specific images of nuclear danger, proliferating them through the public school system, right. and attuning people who had not experienced a technology and did not know of a danger to a new existential risk. And that was, you know, the build out of the Cold War uh, system was premised on, uh, on that maneuver. And so we are familiar with it, and it's an easy set of references when thinking about any kind of claim on existential danger to rely on that moment as a model. So the first thing I want to do is distance uh, that project and mm -hmm. suggest that um, uh, large-scale ecological events are more complicated, they have many more factors, and the temporalities are, are different enough that it, it uh, is important to see the differences and to not be swayed by the comforts that also come from evoking a kind of existential danger that is very familiar and, in fact, was the basis for statecraft for generations. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's, that's the, the first move of the paper. But the second thing is to absolutely acknowledge what you're talking about in terms of the longevity of, of nuclear contamination and exposures. Um, and that's where I think you know, it's highly likely um, that uh, when the Anthropocene decision from the geological sciences is um, uh, answered you know, from the professional uh, conversations, that the nuclear age will be folded into this. Right. And it's precisely because it's a permanent signature in uh, geology and biologies of every kind. And um, in that sense, it participates and is one more strand in an industrial impact. And so I would fold the nuclear then into, into the petrochemical as a, as a kind of ongoing uh, aftermath. Okay? <laughs> And, um, and then there's just these kind of eerie parallels, which is that you know, the, the measurements around you know, what they're calling the great acceleration in terms of consumption patterns, mostly coming out of Europe and America, is uh, completely linked with the development of the nuclear economy. And these things are, um, are closely uh, intertwined at the level of sciences at the level of statecraft, at the level of you know, the development of a consumer economy in the 1950s was also uh, partly the way of bracketing the terror of nuclear war to suggest that constant increasing uh, comforts in the home is a pushback on the idea of, uh, of a nuclear crisis. So, so these things have lots of different loops that are important to, um, to consider. Oh. Uh, yeah. th thanks for such a great paper, and I, I love the the ending with the proliferation of image and images and modes of action. And I also uh, I look forward to uh, dreaming about that noose tonight as I <laughs> uh, after I've gone to sleep. I think that's going to be fun. Uh, so uh, I'll just take you back for a moment to the discussion of Anthropocene. Yeah. Uh, and see what you make of it, uh, because. There is the, the case, whether it's sufficient or not, is that it's a, um, it's a shocking and, and needed dramatization of what's happening in the world today. Yeah. Then there is the, also the second case that, well, that in, your, in the four critiques of it, it names people as core agents, but I don't think that the geological authors of the term do that, and so that has been a kind of a humanist uh, uh, mm -hmm. false 
uh, grabbing over of it and a falsification of it because uh, they've been pushing the themes, or many of them are pushing the themes of self-organizing processes that intersect and sometimes change rapidly yeah. uh, before that before we intervene. That's why you have the early extinctions up and so forth. And so it 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 the the one that seems the most powerful is that many societies are not today anthropocenic. That's a terribly important one to focus on, and uh, and yet. Uh, we are all affected by these processes. So uh, I don't expect uh, geologists and uh, uh, paleontologists and a whole group of people to, to give good explanations about how capitalism yeah. makes the difference. We're supposed to try to do that. Uh, in, in, in the, uh, and kind of capitalism and communism make the difference. And so I'm, uh, I'm wondering whether something is lost in giving up the notion of Anthropocene for its dramatization and shock effects rather than yeah. radically reworking it. Yeah. That's, kind of, that's kind of my question. And I even worry a little bit, about, I'm a fan of Haraway, but when she talks about naturalizing specific periods, the discussion of naturalization in the 90s was uh, offering us a notion of nature that's bankrupt. Uh, and so, uh, and so, I would kind of rethink that too a little bit. Her, sure. The formulation. Uh, I don't know what I'm saying here, but I just wonder if you want to <laughs> yeah. comment on on the the, the value and, and yeah. risk of kind of going uh, reworking or dropping. Sure. The, the sure. Idea. Thanks. Um, well, I hope I underscored that I actually think um, what the earth scientists have done is really important actually in advancing yeah, did, the yeah. conversation and, and frankly the way they've staged it as a uh, inquiry that has an uncertain result is something, I mean, how many of us can take our disciplinary concerns and turn them into a global conversation, <laughs> let, let alone one that has this kind of impact and importance yeah. for every living yeah. being on the planet. So, so, I mean, I think it's spectacular, and I actually think um, it pulls on a number of moments of similar activity among the earth scientists, and I mentioned, you know, the nuclear winter debates of the 1980s, and also, you know, the very successful campaign against atmospheric fallout in the 1950s, which, you know, forced the US and the Soviet Union at the height of their aggression towards each other to change their testing regimes and bring it underground. It didn't stop those testing regimes, it consolidated them, but um, in terms of the health effects, this was, a, this was a, a major environmental achievement. And it was precisely through this kind of an intervention that uh, that, that was rendered possible. So, um, so I would want to distinguish a little bit in the conversation about the Anthropocene what the technical logics within the geological and earth sciences are for making a judgment versus the politics of shock that are part of the kind of rollout of the concept and the invitation to consider it. And I think uh, as part of a geological science point of view, it's, it's uh, a completely uh, logical category that I think will be with us for a very long time. But I do want to consider the um, full range of political implications yeah. for it. And I think, you know, one, crude way of interpreting the Anthropocene is to say, well, we are now post-nature. We are beyond the need as a species to worry about protecting uh, you know, other kinds of creatures because there's an industrial signature everywhere. Geoengineering looks like a good industrial response to a, to a kind of collective problem. Um, and you know, so the end of, of kind of a, a notion of conservation or uh, a kind of um, you know radical concern about endangerments of non-humans that that also that's a that's a, for another era, you know there's a kind of neoliberal response to the Anthropocene which is I think something that uh, needs to be uh, carefully managed, no, challenged, um, challenged or challenged yeah. directly yeah and and I mean certainly the, uh, many many of the the key players in these debates are doing this every day so and and uh, and trying to capture the complexity of a problem that is about the interaction between many different kinds of complex systems, yeah, which is truly an extraordinary challenge. Um, so the, the other part of your comment, though, which I thought was really great, which is to say um, this shouldn't all rest on the scientific experts that understand Earth systems to craft 
not only the language and the politics and the beautiful frames that can do the kind of social work that we need around, the, around these issues. And so um, you know, I take this conference to be a serious intervention in doing precisely the kind of work in the humanities and the social sciences that would um, you know, support and extend uh, the basic impulses around the Anthropocene conversation. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for your very <laughs> elegant paper, very uh -huh. elegant argument, which I'm fully on board with. But I wanted to ask you about your curatorial choices uh, of the, the art you have decided to, to, to punctuate your extinctions with, which are also very elegant, and they inscribe themselves in a very particular kind of modernist yeah, aesthetic. And I'm just, and obviously the diagrams you showed us are very exuberant. They show a certain excess. While the art, in mean, all the different pieces, be it still yeah. moving or installations, they, they present a very particular visuality. It's a very elegant art from which everything that should have been eliminated has been eliminated. It gives a certain visual pleasure while also being located yeah. in a very particular modern period. And while there are lots of, as I'm sure you know, because you've mentioned like Haus der Kultur der Welt in Berlin, which ran a two-year anthropocene project with lots of different kinds of art, mm -hmm. you've obviously made a series of conscious decisions to frame your argument in this particular way. Mm -hmm. So I would be very curious to hear a little bit more about your yeah. particular kind of visuality around this. Yeah, thanks for that question. And you're totally right. I mean, the white walls of an, exe of an uh, exhibition space are a very particular um, arena to stage uh, a conversation, and of course, um, this was uh, an exhibit that was curated by Hamza Walker, and I was invited to respond to it. And so this is this was kind of the the marvelous uh, experiment on my side to uh, uh, think with uh, an exhibition in this way. Um, but I am interested in a broader sense with the question of scientific visualization right now, and the question of we need. Uh, complex visualizations to understand the kind of complex problems that are involved in environment, right? So there's no kind of alternative to the visualization. Um, how they're produced, the aesthetic uh, values of them, what ends up being convincing and motivating for a broad kind of uh, viewer base, though, is a really different kind of question. And I'm still kind of early in my thinking about what that looks like, but, um, but this is part of a consideration of um, visualization itself as a, as a way to um, understanding and collective mobilization. And partly I come to that having studied um, the way in which these processes function for the nuclear state, in which right from the very beginning, the question of how to create a representation for the bomb that would do a certain kind of social work was um, the expert project of um, psychologists, social scientists, um, that really crafted a very serious intervention into American life precisely by deploying images and carefully uh, crafted propaganda films to mobilize the public. And it was you know, hugely influential. Uh, everybody that came through um, you know, the public education system for a couple of generations is a nuclear subject, partly you know, pro and con because of, uh, of these texts and these interventions. So I have an example of a very, um, I wouldn't want to say successful, but a very powerful kind of public mobilization through uh, strategic visualizations. And I have been asked in a number of ways, like what could be done on climate change that would have an equal um, effect? And um, so I don't have the answer to that, but I know what I wouldn't want, which would be you know, a singular branding of, 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 of climate in a way that would reduce its um, complexity and also create a, a kind of iconic existential danger for a new, a new era. And I think um, the politics of that that have played out over the last uh, 60 years in the nuclear arena are quite complicated. And uh, so not even an, a, an attempt to answer <coughs> your question, mm -hmm. but thank you for it. Okay, well, I'm so sorry. We have questions uh, time for only one more, and I, I did it in a race of hands. So I think, Carrie, it's yours. Oh, yeah, that, that was a great paper, thanks. And I was, I was, uh, I think the most striking thing in your paper to me was the map you showed of where uh, emissions are produced and where they end up in, ter in terms of their effect, which to me is a snapshot of the fact of biopolitics yeah. and the fact of what's been called uh, a massive letting die. Right. 
And so what I, the question I'd like to ask is, is how to relate that biopolitical fact to um, a question I want to ask you that seems simple, but it's really complicated, and that is, do you think if the United States had experienced nuclear weapons in the Second World War in the way that Japan did, if we had had a nuclear um, attack in the United States, do you think it's more likely that the U.S. now would be assuming a very different posture of global leadership in relation to these questions? which is a simple question and a complicated question. So my question is, yeah. what do you think about that, and how is that related to this other dimension, which is a biopolitical dimension, and they're both tied up with neoliberalism yeah. in very complicated ways? Yeah. Well, let me take a, take a stab at it. Um, I mean, the first thing that I think that is complicated in a way that is um, more subtle than we often uh, acknowledge is the shift to planet and species thinking. That link to suggest that uh, you know industrial activity is now a, a species level contribution and requires a species level problem um, makes it more difficult to see the kind of differences that this chart represents. I think quite quite clearly and shockingly. Um, and also, we lose the opportunity to think with those societies that have figured out how to live in ways that aren't particularly transforming the planet, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's also here a re in that scaling up of a reduction of human diversity that could be mm -hmm. an important resource for understanding alternative modes of living. So, you know, that simple kind of gesture is, I think, an important one to, um, to forward in a discussion of the biopolitical here. On the, on the issue of the, the status of the US, um, you know, I've thought a lot about why it is that the environment has never been a national security problem. And um, I think there's a complicated set of uh, debates about that um, post-World War II that has very much to do with uh, nuclear power and American sovereignty and the ability to think those things as the same thing uh, across different regimes. Um, what's happening now in the national security debates is climate change is starting to be folded in as a security concern, but not as something that needs to be mitigated and changed, but more as a register of a more violent and unstable world that will need more militarization. And so, um, so you know, I posited at one time, you know, why isn't the, you know, the, the EPA our national security agency? Or why, you know, we have all sorts of agencies that have been concerned with environmental regulation and management. Uh, why don't we consider them actually, uh, you know, security agencies of, of uh, a primary kind? And I think the history of their development and um, the politics around uh, promoting industry and nuclear industry in particular, along with petrochemical industry, is, you know, one way to tell the story about American power in the last, uh, you know, uh, 70 years. Um, so. I mean, I have a few more things we can talk about, I guess, you know, in a, in a more general sense, but that's where I feel right now. Yeah. Thank you very much. So let's uh, start the breakout.